Manx Radio Podcasts, powered by Shaw. The Nation Station, Manx Radio. Women Today. Fast and my good afternoon. It is just coming up to six minutes past two and this is Women Today with me, Christy Dehaven, uh, flying solo, as I mentioned earlier, with Stu because today we have another of our special Conister Rocks biographical programmes. Uh, this is where we get to spend the full hour in the company of some of the island's best known and best loved personalities. We find out a bit about their lives, about their work and also about the music that means something to them. And I'm delighted to be joined in the studio this afternoon by a critically acclaimed author, uh, a former island resident, Chris Ewan. His former residency here is important, I should say. That's the reason I'm bringing this up, because, of course, several of his books, including the number one best-selling thriller, Safe House, are in fact set right here on the Isle of Man, featuring Manx locations, events and even superstitions to great effect. Uh, The international media calls his work truly compelling chilling and outstanding even. He's blushing in front of me now, I can see. Uh, His books have been hailed as popular fiction at its best and in 2011 he was voted one of America's favourite British authors by a Huffington Post poll, which is no mean feat. Uh, Yeah, yeah, he's a proud husband and father as well and uh, he can tell you far too much about how to be a good thief. Uh He can. Uh, Chris Ewan, welcome. It's lovely to have you with us. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. And especially good to have you with us considering you've pretty much only just left the island. (laughs) I know, only three weeks ago, I think, for Manx Lit Fest. Yeah. And so we're back very soon afterwards. But no, it's it's UK half term, so we're able to come back. So it's always good to be back on the Visit family and everything. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned Lit Fest there. Just for people who weren't here or might not not be aware, just tell us a little bit about what your involvement was at Lit Fest this year. Uh, Lit Fest this year I was kindly invited over uh, I have a new role as patron of Lit Fest so um, I, I was also invited to take part in Lit Fest this year and I helped run some writing workshops uh, during the day which were great fun actually some really sort of good input from the people that came along great numbers of people coming along what sort of ages and what sort of backgrounds were you getting it was uh, adult writers but um, a complete age range and um, a number of very talented writers because also uh, Lit Fest had arranged for a literary agent from my literary agency, Shieldland Associates, uh, an agent called Gaia Banks, to come over and hear pictures from various writers who came on the day. And I know she was particularly impressed by the standard, and um, she requested full manuscripts from several of the people that came along, which is by no means normal. I mean, it's very hard to get an agent to invite you to send in a full manuscript. So she was seriously impressed. So that was great. And then in the evening, you and I got to chat. We did, in front of people. In it front wasn't of people, like, yeah, know, that's right. We went to the bar or something. Yeah. <laughs> there was, well, there was people listening. Yes. Yeah, and that was really good. And again, excellent feedback because you're very open about talking about your work. Do you enjoy talking about it? Am I open about talking about Well, you work? certainly were that night. You've made no me way, nervous but... now about what I might say on the radio today. <laughs> I'm probably too open about talking about You can about tell us work. anything. It's okay, fine, Chris. There's okay. no one listening, really, honestly. Sure. <laughs> but yeah, do you enjoy talking about your work then? Um, I do. I mean, I mostly enjoy doing the work and yeah. writing on my own in a yeah. study with imaginary people around me. But um, no, it is a pleasure to talk to people about the work. And it only happens because people have been reading the books and hopefully enjoying the books. So that's always a good sign. So um, no, I'm always happy to talk about the books on the Isle of Man because that's where it all started for me. Yeah, we'll come to that in a minute, but I am going to pick you up on something you just said. Uh-oh. With imaginary people around you. Oh, uh, yes. So is that is that how you work then? You sit in your study and, and these sort of figures just sort of materialise around sort of you. sort of hovering over them. me from behind. Yeah. Not really, <laughs> but I'm just conscious. Um, I, I, yeah, back in the day when I was trying to get published, and it took me sort of 10 years to get published, so there came a point when my wife did say, you know, you, you really need to quit if you don't get your break soon because you're not having much of a life, we're not having much of a life, you're in your study the whole time with just people in your head, which was a fair point. Um, but unfortunately for her, I did just get my break before a kind of self-imposed deadline. So um, <laughs> those imaginary people have persisted, unfortunately. And uh, we'll, we'll come to the break a little bit later, but I'm, I'm intrigued. We'll, st- we'll start back at the beginning then. Mm-hmm. What were you like as a child? Did you have a, a super vivid imagination and were you always sort of creating characters in your head? Or um, I think I did quite a lot of reading. Mm-hmm. I sort of felt like I wasn't doing much reading. And now in hindsight, I look back, I think I did quite a bit. I, I was a kid that was always encouraged to go to the local library and get loads of books out, which is where I first sort of found my way to crime fiction via... Uh, the Famous Five and The Secret Seven and Sherlock oh, Holmes's books that. and things like yeah. that. Um, and, and then on to Agatha Christie. Uh, and I just loved writing. I was always a kid in class that when, when we did creative writing, would sort of write too much and then 
write you know terrible poetry in my spare time uh and does any of that still exist chris of course (laughs) probably somewhere joe's Joe's keeping it safe for blackmail purposes probably (laughs) um and yeah i just i always just love writing and love using sort of language um and so i guess that was always my focus but i never dreamed i might be able to become a writer that was nothing that really occurred to me until many years later i guess it's not really taught as being a profession as such is it in in schools no and it's you know, I never met a published writer until I became a published writer. Yeah. And so if you don't have those experiences where you meet people um, and you get to go to book events and you get to see that actually there's no magic to becoming a writer as long as you, you know, write a, hopefully a good book and send it in, there's every chance that you can be published. And I think I had sort of formed the opinion that there must be some magic route into it that people had that would elude me. But um mm. Yeah, so it was, it was a sort of strange dream to develop over time. And and to begin with, as I say, it was just fun to write from, for my own sake, really. And you you did, you went on a, a writing retreat at quite a young age, didn't you? Is that where the sort of seed was sown? Yeah, that's true. That I grew up in Somerset and the local county council used to run a scheme where they picked sort of two kids from each state school who they thought were good at English. And they'd mm. send them to this residential course at Kiel for a week. Uh, and I was lucky enough to be picked and I turned up and I think it was probably organised by a local university. And so there was a sort of writing tutor. And then there were about eight or so students who must have been on this course who were uh, just seemed to me very cool at the time. And they, they encouraged us to do creative writing for a whole week. Uh, and so we sort of wrote poems about trees and all this kind of thing. And there was one particular night where um, we went down into a basement area and they'd lit candles and they weren't wearing berets, but they were playing <gasps> acoustic guitar. And it Almost just... Almost dead poets. Yeah, yeah, and so that was the closest I come to sort of real writers and suddenly it seemed pretty cool. And um, I think that set me on the way to thinking, well, if the school thinks I might be all right at this, maybe there is a chance that I can do something like this down the line. And do you remember the first sort of proper story that you wrote with real with sort of proper characters and things in I it. can remember a very bleak poem I wrote on that week that ended up in a kind of you know school magazine or something uh, and and then I didn't really attempt proper writing until I was 20 that was when I started my first novel um, so I write various sort of short stories but they would never go anywhere I'd never complete them so I probably had just drawers of unfinished stories but it just proves it's never too late to start, though, really, doesn't it? Because actually you, you trained as something entirely different. You went on a completely different route, didn't you? I did. I, um, I did a degree in American literature and Canadian literature at university, which, you know, as you can imagine, didn't lead to many job opportunities. And so after a year of sort of trying to find out what I was going to do in my life, I ended up retraining to be a lawyer. Um, but by that point, I had had my first sort of little niggle of interest from a literary agent in my work. So I was trying to write on the side while being a lawyer, which is not the best balance to strike. But um, that's what I was attempting to do. That must have been difficult because a lawyer's work is never done, really, is it? You seem to be working sort of all hours. So how on earth did you fit that in? Well, I was working for I was training at a London law firm and the hours were to my surprise, very long. I had no idea because, again, I didn't know any lawyers. Mm. And um, you know, I would be working till very late at night and uh, in early in the morning. But I was so determined to become a writer that I would just always get up an hour or two before I had to get up to write. Uh, and my weekends in London were spent writing books. Uh, and eventually it led to a sort of breakthrough. Do you think you spent all that time meeting the people that you met as a lawyer, sort of forming these constant ideas in your head? Were you always sort of, every time you met someone, thinking, oh, they could be a character, or oh, this could be a storyline, or because you, you do write crime fiction, so I do. was it all sort of linked? No, it never, it never works out that way. I very rarely use people that I've met in real life in any of my sort of writing. Uh, I think the thing it did do was I realised I was a lousy lawyer, and I realised how long <laughs> the hours were, and it made me even more determined to try and make it as a writer so that I wasn't sort of um, in that work environment basically but the the one thing that was relevant was uh, when I was training to be a lawyer the final six months of my training were in Amsterdam uh, which I had visited before but not for a prolonged period and then I just fell so in love with the city that that then became the setting for my first published novel. Which was, of course, The Good Thief's Guide to Amsterdam. It was, yes. So where did the idea of The Good Thief come from then? Um, I think I wanted to really try and combine travel writing with crime fiction. That was the genesis of it, um, because I part of when I was growing up, I sort of dreamed of being a travel journalist, which I never really pursued. Uh, and, and I thought it would be interesting to set a crime no- novel or a series of crime novels, which moved to a different city for each book in the series. 
uh, which had been done before, but obviously I thought I was the first to think of this great new idea. Uh, and I'd always enjoyed crime novels tied from the um, perspective of a criminal. And the idea of having a burglar as your lead character just really intrigued me because you could have so much fun with that idea. I mean, I always sort of say, if you're running a police procedural and, and your police detective needs to find a clue, it might be in the premises where a suspect lives and so they have to go and get a search warrant. Well, a burglar doesn't have to do that. They just wait till after dark and break in and find the clue. Uh, and you can lay clues and you can yeah play all kinds of things. Uh, and the third ingredient was that I love the genre so much I wanted to write about a lead character who was also themselves a crime writer. So it became a kind of games within games sort of thing in the book. And Charlie is a very, very popular character, obviously, himself. Um, do you remember when he first sort of walked into your world as such? You know, I'm thinking those imaginary characters that you've got around <laughs> you as you're writing. Did he sort of walk in fully formed or did you really have to craft him? He just sort of developed as I was writing the first chapter. What I can remember very distinctly is being in our in the attic of our townhouse in Douglas, which had no heating. And I used to go up there and write. And I can remember finally getting down to a nutshell what the idea for the book would be. And I can remember getting quite excited and coming down and telling my wife, I think I might have something this time. I'm sort of pitching her the book idea. Did she uh, roll her eyes? <laughs> <laughs> she always rolls her eyes. No, I think she said, yeah, you might as well try that. But I felt like I, it was the first time. That was my, my first published book was the fourth book I'd written. And it was the first time I felt as if I'd come up with a story that people might really want to read. Um, so I can still remember that. Oh, what a moment. And we have talked a little bit about uh, your youth at the start there. And so we'll come to your first music choice, which is linked to your youth, isn't it? This Fleetwood Mac song. Yes, it is. I mean, talking about sort of going to the library when I was a kid, what I distinctly remember is most summer holidays, my parents would take us camping for two or three weeks, usually in France. Uh, and I would be told to go to the library and get six library books out that I could read on the holiday so that I could leave them in peace. Uh, but generally there would always be some sort of music that I associate with each trip uh, and, and various different albums that my dad would be playing in the car as we were driving along and this Fleetwood Mag uh, track really reminds me of that. Excellent. Uh, Chris Ewan, this is your first piece of music. It is Fleetwood Mag, Go Your Own Way. Loving you isn't the right thing Change things that I feel If I could of music there. It's the first choice from our Conister Rock special guest this afternoon, who is the author, Chris Ewan. Uh, Chris, I have to ask you, it's a cheesy link, but I am a DJ. Have you gone your own way? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even prepared for that. I doubt it very much. <laughs> <laughs> You've got plenty of time left yet, don't you worry. Uh, we'll be back after the break, chatting more with Chris and finding out what his other music choices are. Don't go away. The Nation Station Match Radio Women Today. This is Women Today and it is a Conister Rocks special this afternoon. Just came up to 22 minutes past two now. I could tell the omens weren't good. A storm was closing in outside and the afternoon was unusually dark. There were no tree branches scratching the window glass or lone dogs howling at the sky. 
but the October rain was hammering down in a violent frenzy, and the wind coming off the Irish sea was blasting over the sand dunes and the grassy flatlands that fronted the cottage. It gusted against the whitewashed walls and droned in the chimney of the old fireplace just in front of me. A garage door kept slamming out back. It was a garage that contained an awful secret of its own. But here was the real clincher. It was Hop Tune, the Manx Halloween, the phase of the year when the veil between our world and the spirit world is said to be tissue thin. A time for ghosts and ghouls and things that go bump in the night. A date on the calendar that I'd come to fear like nothing else. A day that had haunted me since I was eight years old. Oh, brilliant. In case you just tuned in, that was Chris Ewan reading uh, from his book Dark Tides, which uh, is obviously about Hop Tune. It's or, about or sort Hop Tune. Of, it's about Hop Tune and inspired by and uh, the whole theme of. And it is incredibly spooky, it's I have to say. It's quite spooky and quite atmospheric, hopefully. I hope yeah. so, anyway. Uh, when I first read the section with the footprint, honestly, I sort of chills, really chills. If you haven't yet read it, I highly recommend it. And of course, it's a perfect time of year. To well, read it, Dark Tides. It is almost Hop Tune, so it is the perfect time. It is, because it's okay. only about a week away now, so uh, it made sense for us to hear a little bit of that. Thank you very much for doing that, Chris. And obviously, Hop Tune, for, for every reason that you actually just mentioned there in the in the paragraph, makes sense that it would create the sort of atmosphere for a good, dark and spooky story. But you've used the Isle of Man several times now in, in a number of your works, and uh, and it is, you know, sort of the key feature of, of many of your stories, whether it be the locations, whether it be events, it's off TT bike racing, yep. you know, in, in, in Safe House. Is it an inherently sort of story-rich place then? Or is this just you sort of using what's around you? No, I think it is a story-rich place. and But most most crucially for me, no one else had really claimed it in modern times. I mean, <laughs> crime writers, it, location is so important to all kinds of um, crime fiction, whether it be a, a series or a standalone novel. And luckily for me, I was living in this great location that nobody had really written about um, recently. And so I, I stole it. My, my agent's plan was that I could be the uh, Bergerac of the Isle of Man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it quite worked out that way because I probably wrote stuff that was a bit darker than she was imagining. Um, but I think it, there's just so many stories that can be told here. And in a way, I mean, island settings lend themselves to crime fiction so well because it's almost like the modern equivalent of a sort of lot room mystery, I think. And, yeah. and there's been a big trend in the past few years for mysteries set on islands and thrillers set on islands. So I think I was just lucky that I happened to be here. I suppose it's, it's harder to get away, isn't it, if you're trapped on it's an island? harder to get away, harder for the killer to get away. And um, yeah, the, and, and also, as you said, there are just loads of customs and quirks to the Isle of Man. And and I, I feel that although it's a really fascinating place and I love living here, I feel in the UK it's sometimes an overlooked and a forgotten place. And so the sense of a sort of mystery of inner mystery because of the island being overlooked, so I think that was one of the strengths of the stories probably. Do you think it is an inherently dark place? Because I know there was a rev- one of the reviews actually says, you've revealed the Isle of Man to have a heart of darkness. I know, who knew? No, I don't think it's an inherently dark place, but I, what I was trying to do was sort of clash what might be perceived as the sort of um, the sleepy, law-abiding environment with the Isle of Man with the action you'd find in a kind of American thriller and, and juxtaposing those and seeing what came out of that was really the idea behind Safe House, which was the book that changed everything for me. Mm-hmm. And and it changed everything. It did. It was number one bestseller. And uh, we'll, we'll come to you actually discovering that a little bit later because it's, it's a lovely moment. But I'm intrigued then to know, because obviously the Isle of Man has therefore been sort of a success for you as a writer. Do you think it has changed your process as a writer being here? Because there are people who say that it just has this fantastic sort of creative fizz about it. Would you say that's that's true? Yeah, this, I, I, I do get really woolly when I talk about this because I can't really explain. I think partly there's good omen here for me because this was where I first got published. I got a short story published for the very first time. That was my sort of break in a magazine that went bust about two months after <laughs> publishing fault. me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and it's just a place where I, I just have this kind of clarity of thought in my head and I can go for long walks, usually in a plantation or on the coast. And it's generally when I'm walking that story ideas come to me. And so I don't want to jinx it now that I've moved off the island that I won't be able to write away from it. But I do think it lends itself to sort of people who are pursuing creative things over here, for sure. And some of the the storylines themselves have been inspired by things or events or things you've researched and found out about the island. I mean, is it true that um, Long Time Lost is actually, it came from rumours of local witness protection? Yeah, well, Safe House really grew out of rumours I had heard of you know, people over here being involved in witness protection schemes. And whether they be true or not, I mean, it's enough as a fiction writer to just steal that as yeah. the um, the starting point of your book. And, and Long Time Lost 
developed from that as well in that I was writing about um, a privatised witness protection scheme. And so that book starts in Laxey on the Isle of Man before going all across Europe. That's fantastic. And, and I asked you this at the night at Noah, actually, I'll ask you again for those that didn't hear it. Does that mean, because in a long time lost, you've sort of moved off to Europe? That, is that you sort of saying, that, well, that's the end for the Isle of Man as a place? It's not. It would be very poetic it. if it was, because yeah. the, the sort of last scene that's set on the Isle of Man is uh, the lead characters leaving on the ferry and looking back towards the island. And so I could see why you might think that. But that's not my plan. I hope to definitely write more about the Isle of Man in the future. Uh, possibly not for the next couple of books, but I definitely don't think I'm done writing about the place. Oh, we're very pleased to hear that. Now, your next music choice um, represents what you describe in your own words as the best four months of your life. Oh, yes. Yeah, which is I very lovely. I said that. You did, yeah. And this is from when you were living uh, much further afield than just down the road on the Isle of Man. Yeah, so I mentioned at university I studied randomly American literature and Canadian literature. And the reason I'd done that quite cynically, was I had looked for courses where I'd get to study in the States or Canada for a period of time. So I ended up at Nottingham University, and uh, that gave me an opportunity to study at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario in Canada for four months, which is where I met uh, my now wife, Jo, who's from the Isle of Man. Uh, And we became friends out there. Uh, I don't think there was too much studying going on in the four months we were there, but it was just this fantastic... (laughs) Um, environment. I can really remember getting off the plane. I'd, I'd never flown before I went there. I'd certainly never been, you know, to the States, but I'd spent my whole childhood watching sort of, you know, TV shows set in America or reading books set in Canada. And suddenly you walk off the plane into an environment that seems so familiar to you. Um, and it was just the best four months. And as part of that, I uh, got to listen to some Canadian music when I was over there. Um, and so this track is from a band called The Tragically Hip, who uh, had an album out at the time called Trouble, uh, Trouble in the Hen House that I listened to over and over again. And very sadly, Gord Downey, the, the lead singer, passed away last week, The Tragically Hip. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, it kind of cut me in and cut a lot of people, I think, hearing that news. But it's still a joy to listen to this track. It is, and it's a beautiful one. I hadn't heard it before. The lyrics are gorgeous. Do listen. This is Tragically Hip. Or sit silently and listen to our thoughts with illusions of someday cast in a golden light no dress rehearsal this is our Only a very small section of uh, the beautiful song Ahead by a Century by Tragically Hip, which was uh, chosen by Chris Ewan. I did not know that he'd passed away a week ago. That is so sad, Chris. And I'm really glad that you chose that because now I'm going to go and research the band because I didn't know yes, enough about Yes, and I'm going to listen to more of their music. So, yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah. Also, very romantic. Those lyrics are beautifully romantic. Are you romantic? Are you, are you quite soppy? Um, I guess so. I think I like stuff as future choices today will will show that sort of ties back to um your childhood and your sort of you know adolescence and conjures up those feelings and that that song does for me yeah i can i can see that and it's also the poetry i suppose because you mentioned yourself you used to write poetry so i guess does that mean you're you're a bit more in tune with song lyrics and than i i was going to say that was going to be my kind of line today that i think i listen more to to lyrics than music and then i realized i probably wouldn't be able to tell you the lyrics to a number of the choices (laughs) or i'd scramble them up um but i feel as though i do and that's that's one reason why i am I don't listen to a huge amount of music because I get completely distracted by the lyrics and I can't concentrate on anything else while I'm doing it. So I wish I was one of these writers that could listen to music while I was writing, uh, as a number of my friends 
can do, um, but it simply doesn't work for me. I have to be in silence. So otherwise, my my mind just drifts. Yeah, or instrumental or classical music, perhaps. I tried, I tried, no. but no, I, I'm too, you know. You get swept up in it, so you are romantic, I thought. As Maybe, much. let's go with yeah. that, yeah. yeah and not that, that I've only got, you know, the ability to focus on one thing at one time. <laughs> Yeah, we'll just we'll just we'll just flit over that, ignore <laughs> that one. And I mentioned romance, obviously, as you mentioned that that song itself reminds you of the, the time when you met Joe, and, and yep. who is now your wife, of course. Indeed. And, and um, I'm curious to know whether she plays a part in your writing process at all. Is is there any involvement there? Do you run things past? Yeah, her no, or? she plays. I think she plays an increasing part in my writing process because I pretty much bounce everything off her as I go along. I used to be very precious about guarding the ideas for a period of time before I tell anyone about them. Uh, and now increasingly I sort of tell her earlier and earlier because, you know, I know I can trust her judgment and she'll tell me if it's a terrible idea or not. Um, but she reads, she's always my first reader. Stephen King um, wrote a fantastic book called On Writing, which is still the best book about writing I've ever read, and it's part memoir, part writing guide, and he talks about you should always have an ideal reader, and every book you write, you're really just writing for that one reader and saying, soppy as it is, Joe is probably that ideal reader. Yeah. That is lovely. So is she a fan of the, the genre herself then, or is it just, just you? She has <laughs> been forced over the years to become a fan of the genre because I will throw books at her and say, you must read this, it's fantastic, and she does, and then she tries to get me to read her books and too often I don't uh, which she tells me frequently um, but yeah no she is pretty knowledgeable about the um, crime fiction genre and she has certain favourites as well so, so you good. you yourself though because you do read you did, did say you do read yourself quite a lot D- does that mean you, do, you don't tend to branch out and then you're not not like a, a chick lit fan or a rom-com fan or anything I quite like YA novels I'm a big John Green fan um, I mostly youth, read, youth adult fiction is it yes yeah. yes I, I'm, I mostly read crime fiction Largely because that's you know my sort of first love, yeah. but also because I have to know what other people are doing and I have to know where the market's at and what readers are wanting at a particular time. Um, and, and so back in the day, I used to read more literary fiction, I guess, than I do now. But um, it still just depends what my mood is. And I often revisit books that are favourite books um, you know, at different periods of the year. So. Does it not make it difficult, though? And again, I think this may be something I asked you when we were chatting in Noah, but when you're reading your own genre written by other people, does that not then put ideas in your head that you find it very hard to shake off and not want to steal? No, it doesn't put ideas in my head. I mean, I, I think it, if, if anything, it makes you more conscious of the fact that you've got to find a gap that hasn't been exploited before. And that's what I'm always trying to do is write a story in a way that hasn't been done before. That's my sort of plan is to try and put a new spin on stories. Um, but it probably does. It Yeah, I don't. It, it makes me conscious of people's style and their writing style. I had to be very careful with particular writers. Lee Child, for example, has this fantastic, um, very taut, very straight, uh, very punchy style. And I can very easily get drawn into imitating that if I'm not careful. So I had to be careful at what stage I am in writing a book when I read a Lee Child book for instance. But I presume that's then what the, the relationship with your editor might be useful for because they would presumably pick up on things like that as well and, and I would hope work? I've I've spotted that before it ever before gets it goes, in front of an yeah. editor um, and I'm probably quite wary of doing that. You always have to try and you know, everyone talks about you've got to write with your own unique writing voice uh, and so you have to try and get into the headspace where you're doing that and, and avoid the influences. So, yeah, there are times when I would probably be at a stage of a book where I wouldn't read too much. But on the whole, I'm reading all the time. And what is it like then when you get to that point when you've run it past Joe, it's been through the editor and then actually it's going out to the big wide world? Is every, that really scary? Every stage of it, um, just I'm played with doubts. So the moment Joe reads it and says it's fine, I then send it to my agent, at which point I have about two days of a complete breakdown thinking that she's gonna <laughs> phone me up and tell me to go and get a, a job doing something else and then you do that again when it goes to your editor and then you do it again when it goes to reviewers and again when it goes to readers so I don't think I don't know any writers uh, I don't think that aren't played with self-doubt I mm. think it's just part of the process and even though you try and recognize that and adjust to it I don't think you ever can entirely now, I asked you, and we, we asked our Conister Rocks guests this, to think of some key moments that happened in your life that, you know, sort of really sort of taken you on this path as such. And as we've sort of alluded to so far anyway, several super key moments happened for you right here on the Isle of Man. The first one being in Derby Square. Tell us about that. Yeah, I was, um, when I first moved over, my wife and I uh, were living in a basement flat in Derby Square. And uh, I had written a short story for a magazine called Inc., uh, and it was a short story called Race, uh, loosely based around the TT. 
and I'd sent it off to a magazine competition. And then one day, this was in the day uh, days of dial up internet, I sort of logged on and suddenly there was the an email in there. Already. <laughs> <laughs> there. There was an email there saying that I'd won the competition and my short story was going to be published in the magazine. As I say, the magazine went bust about two months later, hopefully not linked to this. Uh, but that was the first thing I ever got published and the first time that anyone you know, really said, yeah, you might, you might be able to do this. Uh, so that was definitely a key moment for me. And then also uh, when you, you heard that you were going to be published as an author writing an actual book as well, yes, that yes. happened over here too. At what point when you hear news like that, do you then make the decision to actually jack in what would be classed as real work? Because <laughs> that <laughs> when, is a brave step to make. When you can earn enough money to justify it. <laughs> um, yeah, that was amazing. That was a phone call came to me at, at work on the Isle of Man from the author Susan Hill, who'd set up a competition and the phone went at work one day and I just picked up and it was Susan Hill on the other end saying, you've won my competition, you're going to be a published author. And it had taken me 10 years to get to that point. And it's still probably the best moment of my life answering that phone call. Um, and gradually after the first book was published, I was able to go part time as a lawyer. And then uh, I was I was actually made redundant just before I wrote Safe House, which gave me a kind of five month window in which to try and write a book that might change things. And, you know, it was one of those fortuitous times in life where everything came together. And luckily for me, Safe House did change things um, and went on to be a hit. So maybe things are meant to happen. Oh, well, we're going to come to your next piece of music now, which uh, now this sort of resonates with me as well, because this album by the, the County Crows I listen to nonstop at university and you've you've chosen uh, a song by them. Just tell us what song it is and why you've chosen it. Uh, it's Sullivan Street from August and Everything After, which I think I listen to over and over again during my university years. I was torn whether to choose an REM track or a County Crows track. And I love the County Crows just because it does conjure up for me sort of America and Americana. Uh, and so that's why I chose this one. And it is a great tune, Chris Ewan. Thank you very much for picking it. song by Counting Crows that is Sullivan Street as chosen by Chris Yu and our special Conister Rocks guest this afternoon we'll be chatting more with him after this The Nation Station Manx Radio Women Today. This is Women Today and it is a Coniston Rock special. Just coming up to 17 minutes to three now. I just had a lovely message in. Uh, joined by Chris Ewan this afternoon, author of Safe House. And Brian has messaged to say, I read Safe House a few months ago, found it to me the, be the most inventive novel that I've read for a long time. Wow, that's very nice. So there Thank you go. You. Um, he did actually put incentive novel, but I think he means inventive. Either one is good. Yeah, either one is good, yeah. isn't it? Now, just, just before we carry on with Chris, a uh, quick mention of the fact that uh, the friends of Sophia Goulden are holding a screening of Suffragette at Balakameen Studio Theatre on Friday. Tickets are just £5. You can get them from Celtic Gold, Shakti Man, uh, Peter Norris Music or telephone 478632. So that's a really good opportunity to see that film on Friday night. Uh, speaking of movies, are you a movie fan, Chris Ewan? I am a movie fan, yes, yeah. but probably not highbrow movies. I like action movies. They're my favourites. I love that. Do you like the sort of cheesy ones, the sort of diehards and that kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, so I rewatched Air Force One recently. It's Mu- a good one. Much undervalued classic. <laughs> That was my birthday choice, and um, yeah, my poor wife had to watch that, but then she 
discovered what a joy it was. So you it know, is a yeah, joy. People should come out and rent Air Force Ones a night. I love it. And there was talk, wasn't there, of um, some screen adaptations of your own work? What's happening there? There's still stuff going on. You you don't tend to hear too much as the writer unless there's really exciting news or really depressing news. But um, I know at the present time, the um, adaptation of The Good Thief's Guide is being pitched to US networks. So I have everything crossed that we Ooh. might get good news. You never know. Uh, there's a film adaptation in the works of my novel Deadline, which I've seen the script for, and I know they're taking that out to people at the moment. Um, and there's various other little bits bobbing around at the moment that I can't talk about. But um, yeah, it'd be a nice dream if it ever came about. Uh, there was a, a question that was thrown at you at the uh, Noah Bakehouse sort of audience with event that you did for Litfest, and somebody asked if you had any actors in mind for Charlie for Good Thief's Guide uh, if it was adapted for screen. Yes, and I can't remember who I said, because I tend to forget. <laughs> who I, I don't tend to think that way partly because i don't want to jinx it um and partly because i don't really think that visually in terms of the characters but i think at the time when the good thief was first optioned i was thinking of um joshua jackson the actor oh, the that's role right. of charlie yeah uh, just because he has that kind of flip and you know comedic timing that i think you would need for the role uh but there are, you know any casting director i'm sure would be much savvier than me in making the right choice how did you find it um switching from writing the series Good Thief's Guide which of course gives you so many opportunities to carry on with it to then going to standalone novels was it was it difficult no well it was difficult in that I had grown familiar over four books with the kind of the pacing and the voice I was using in The Good Thief and and there's a sort of safety net in that but at the same time you kind of chafe against that a bit I think and you want to do something different um, and so it was very exciting to write a standalone novel for the first time and the great thing about standalone novels is that all bets really are off because if you're writing about a serious character you can put them in peril but your readers always know they're going to get out of it at the end because of course they have to come back for the next book in the series but when you're doing a standalone it really can be that your lead character's you know in ultimate peril and I think that makes it more interesting for you as a writer and potentially more interesting for readers as well but Mm. ultimately I think it's good to have the balance. And uh, speaking of lead characters, are there any sort of characters through literary fiction that you are very attached to yourself that you wish you'd written? Uh, and not that I wished I'd written because I wouldn't do as good a job, but there's loads of characters. Um, Philip Marlowe in the Raymond Chandler novels will always remain my kind of favourite lead character. Uh, recently, I've been reading a lot of Michael Connolly's uh, Harry Bosch and Mickey Haller novels. Um, and yeah, it, it will end up. I'll give you a list of crime fiction <laughs> heroes. We'll be here all afternoon. Um, but yeah, there's a ton of them. That I, you know, you, I think that's the great joy of series is when you really get to know a character over a series of books and you enjoy hanging out with them time and again. Mm-hmm. Well, let's hear another choice of music from you. Uh, we have some Groove Armada now, which I is know. a very interesting choice. This is because. I don't often listen to music when I'm I'm working, as I say, but very occasionally I I try and get myself in the right sort of frame of mind to write a particular book or a particular scene and and evoke the tone I want to evoke. And uh, I had seen the movie Collateral with Tom Cruise and this Groove Armada track plays over the opening of that movie. And it was the kind of tone I wanted to go for in my kidnap uh, thriller deadline. So every morning before I would sit down to write, I would play this track. So... Over a nine-month period, that's quite a lot of listens. Uh, but I still love it now, and it still conjures up the feel of the novel to me. So, Excellent. Uh, that's why I picked it. This is Groove Armada, Hands of Time.
great tune again. I'm really loving Chris Ewan's music choices this wow, afternoon. I'm surprised. These are great. This is Groove Armada, Hands of Time. Another one that I have to admit I did not know. I just have a quick apology to make, Chris. Okay. Uh, at the top of the hour, I read the weather, as we always do, and I might have mentioned it was going to be nice and dry this afternoon because the weatherman told me it would be. Uh, there's a very wet and soggy fence builder who's quite upset with me oh, at the dear. moment because it isn't terribly dry out there. I'm very sorry. I was just doing what I was told. <laughs> um, anyway, we've nearly come to the end of our time. We've got one more bit of music to hear uh, from you, Chris. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this That's afternoon. Uh, so first of all, I have to ask you, what is next then? Because I know you've just sort of um, re-released Good Thief's Guide, haven't you? Yes, I've re-released the Good Thief's Guide novels on ebook. Mm-hmm. Um, so the first of those is out for just 99p. And um, I just released a novella, which is a sort of prequel to the whole series called The Good Thief's Guide to Murder, which you can get for free Ooh. by signing up to my um, my author mailing list, which is on my website. Uh, and yeah so that's just done and I'm just writing a proposal for a new book at the moment which I hope will turn into something you never quite know but um, I think I've got an interesting idea which I can't tell you about but uh, yeah I, I'm but looking forward it, to exploring that first. a bit more yeah. um, I, I love the fact that when, when you first came in to, uh, earlier on we were chatting before we came on air and you were saying you're, you're back staying with family obviously while you're here and you're actually using the study that you wrote Safe House in to try and put this proposal together yeah my father-in-law lives in um West Baldwin has a, a a rental apartment, a holiday rental apartment underneath the house. And um, for a period of time uh, after I was made redundant, my wife and I were living there. And uh, I had about uh, six months to start with where I knew I was still going to receive redundancy pay. And while I was living there, I wrote Safe House. And um, it was brilliant because I'd, I'd go for a walk through Baldwin, which is so beautiful oh, in the morning. it's a gorgeous part of the island. Be at my desk for nine in the morning. At 11, my dog would drop a tennis ball by my feet and I'd go and throw a tennis ball for the dog. And then I'd write all afternoon. And it was just a fantastic time. So I'm, I'm sort of going back into that study now, which is now a bedroom, and uh, <laughs> trying to remember those times and hope that it rubs off on me. Is it difficult with the kids? Does it make it sort of hard to focus? Yeah, it's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a five-year-old and a one-year-old and um, they make a lot of noise and <laughs> I, I can't really deal with noise. So, uh, yeah, I have to um, find little quiet places to write. Um, so it's not quite happening this week, but I got a bit done this morning. The kids were out this morning, so I got a bit done. Oh, I love that. Well, I just had a message in from Joe. Thank you so much for messaging, Joe. Uh, Joe says, I've just finished reading A Long Time Lost. Really enjoyed it. Picked it up at random from the bookshop. Didn't know it was... Uh, uh didn't know it started just on the Isle of Man, but not only that, but also in my home village of Laxey. Uh-huh. Excellent plot. Really loved the characters. Uh, looking forward to reading more. Oh, that's lovely to hear. Isn't that that's nice? Very so nice. Thank, thank you very you much, Joe, for letting us know. And we very much look forward to hearing what is coming next from you, this proposal. Good luck with that one. Thank you. Um, I have to ask you, what is the best thing about being a writer? Uh, tragically, it's the writing itself. How how sad is that to say? But no. When I start a new book, and usually the first four or five chapters, that is the best moment. And it takes me about nine months to write a book, and usually in that time, there's probably only five days where it really feels like I'm on the right track and it's all going easily. Um, and probably those five days come as the first five days, uh, and that's the best moment for sure. Oh, well, Chris, you know, it's been an absolute joy talking to you this afternoon. We have one more piece of music to hear from you, which comes from the legendary Benny Key. Uh, let us know what this choice of music is and why you've chosen it. Um, so this is Stand By Me, which is chosen in part because of the movie Stand By oh, Me. It's one of the best movies ever. Which I love. And also because it ties into, um, you know, based, of course, on Stephen King's novella, The Body. Uh, which is one of my favourite novellas. And I just it's, it's an often quoted King line, but he has this line at the end where he says, um, I never again had friends like I did when I was 12. Jesus, does anyone? Uh, and, and that whole sort of conjuring up of your adolescence and that, that special time in your life, uh, this now symbolises that for me. Great choice to end with. Uh, it's been lovely speaking with you. Just remind people uh, about, what, about your website and where they can get obviously get your work anywhere, but remind people about your website. That's very kind of you. Yes, they can go to um, www.chrisewen.com uh, or just Google my name and it will take you to the website where you can get a free short story. Yay, free. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, and uh, all the best with the uh, proposal. We look forward to hearing much more from you in the future. Thanks very much. When the night has come And the land is dark And the moon is the only light we'll see No, I won't be afraid Oh, I won't be afraid Just
just as long as you stand, stand by me. So darling, darling, stand by me. Oh, stand by me. Oh, stand, stand by me, stand by me. Tumble and fall, or the mountain should crumble to the sea. I won't cry, I won't cry, no, I won't shed a tear just as long as you stand, stand by me. Women today. Don't sit in the slow lane. Join the fast lane right now with Shaw's all new Superfast Plus broadband. Enjoy more bandwidth, amazing speeds, and the best value on the island from just £23.95 per month. So don't be left behind. Get a piece of the high speed action with Superfast Plus broadband from Shaw. For details, visit our stores in Douglas, Ramsey, and Port Erin or click Shaw.com. Love being Shaw. Terms and conditions apply.